me, uh, oh, I have to sound flower here. Let me do that proper. Okay, give me a sound check, please. Testing, testing, hey, works. minus hey, three. It works, it works. Okay, don't forget to record. Yes, I'm just about to record to the cloud. There we go. Okay, hi everybody on live stream and elsewhere in the world. And it's Tuesday, Cash Plasma Reactor Group night. And um, yep, I'm your host, Rick Cremond. And we'll have a couple of hours of who knows what. Because <laughs> I never do. But uh, we do rely on our friend Lee Coates here to uh, entertain us and uh, tell us what's going on. So I'm going to spotlight his video. And he's got a big jar of gooey looking stuff here. And uh, either he's been out milking the cow or he's got some kind of gas, <laughs> I suspect. Well, thanks, Eric. Uh over the last, uh, I guess, four weeks or so, we've been spinning uh, ping pong balls and plastic balls and uh, glass with uh, lead gants and CA3 gants in it. And uh, everyone in the house seems to be getting sick on me, including me, <laughs> coming down with cold or whatever. It's the wrong time of year for cold. So I was wondering if the, I quit spinning lead gants, basically. I was wondering if that's been draining us of our positive energy. So on the Saturday, I decided to make up some uh, antiviral soup here. So what, you, what you're looking at is uh, coconut oil gants, and uh, I got uh, CO2 and zinc gants mixed in with it. So hopefully, I was hoping it'd have antiviral properties, and I've been. Uh, no, you know, do you have a copper oxide? Not, not in this one, no. If you have uh, copper oxide and CO2, just uh, put a few drops of water, CO2, and copper oxide in a cup and drink it. Yeah, I don't know about the lead GANs causing an issue. Not I've got lead. balls of lead GAN spinning here as well, and it's not affecting myself or my dog in any way right, right now. A lot of people have complained about that, though. That's something that uh, that I've heard many times, uh, and uh, hmm, don't know. It would depend on the particular concoction, no doubt. But some people definitely seem to be having a response to the lead gans. And, um, any other comments about that? Hmm? What do you hmm. think, Armin? I don't think so. It's a psychological point, you know. I don't think any games is affecting, you know. If it's in plasmatic state, why should it affect your body? Because your body is in a plasmatic state. Okay, but it takes what it needs. Yeah, once you're in plasmatic state, Rick, you can't force the energy on anyone. It doesn't work that way. It's not like swallowing a pill where you're obligated to go through the effects of the pill. It's just the energy is there, and if you want some of it, you'll take it. If you don't, you won't. Your body carry lead. Well, it could be just a circumstance. Oh, it could be chemtrail flu too, Lee. Yeah, <laughs> it could be. Not sure how much chemtrailing they're doing here up in Calgary, but they're chemtrailing everywhere else. Uh, well, I've just been seeing a bunch of reports of uh, all kinds of fires and stuff going on in Calgary. So there's chances are you got a ton of pollution up there. What I was going to suggest, yeah, there's uh, far forest fires in BC. Then the winds blow over Calgary and so on, and uh, definitely they're having a hard time in Fort McMurray area with all that. There's the pollution from the burning is so bad there. Um, yeah, well, that's that's the, mostly the moving main, off to Saskatchewan. So the main substance that they're dealing with is arsenic in the uh, in the uh, uh, dust in the uh, fallout from the burning. Basically, all the ash is heavy in arsenic, such that 
everything that's ash is basically um, off limits and they have to contain it by pouring this concrete like substance on top to keep it from blowing away yeah I was talking with uh, well, my, my roommate here that was renting my room he's uh, worked up in Fort McMurray and he says uh, the air up there is just terrible uh, lots of times it's, and all that stuff falling out of the air getting into the trees and whatnot so yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, not it's, good. A, it's a major <laughs> issue. I'm hoping that uh, it's something that uh, people involved with the Cash Foundation Canada, hopefully we can come up with some sort of solutions for those kind of situations because this will not be the last time that towns will be burning in uh, northern Canada because uh, the ground's drying up, basically. It's uh, becoming a drier climate year after year, and it's hotter, drier, windier, stormier, and all those conditions lead to more forest fires. And it's going to be a big issue, uh, I think, in the up and coming, you might say. So if we can provide uh, products like for example even in right starting from the beginning with the uh, spraying of the, uh, the fire retardant the fire retardants in toxic stuff they shouldn't be spraying that on places where people exist and other life forms um, it ends up you know getting into the uh, water supply and you have a toxic water supply then which is happening in Fort McMurray and other areas so uh, what if we had some sort of a GANS type uh, fire retardant? Maybe it turns out that CO2 GANS is the perfect uh, fire retardant. For example, what did they use the most fire extinguishers? CO2. Hmm. So <coughs> maybe, maybe it's not only better but cheaper to use a, some kind of GANS like a CO2 GANS and maybe it'll be um, contributing to helping the environment rebuild in terms of uh, you spray it on and it helps the new growth um, occur more quickly and the roots to get established and that kind of thing which we know the CO2 GANs can also do so maybe there's some sort of opportunity there it could be a, easily a multi-million dollar opportunity just in that one aspect alone and then you get into other parts of the fire situation, like, uh, for example, uh, treating people that are burned in a, a severe fire situation. Um, it, it's obvious that CO2 GANs patches and pain pens and, pat and, and, and health pens and so on are all beneficial toward that kind of situation. Probably one of the best materials in the world to use for, for burnt skin, I think. Uh, judging by what it does with my sensitive skin, which I'm very happy with the way the CO2 GANs uh, um, heals and prevents irritation. <coughs> um, then we get into other things like what about the decontamination issues? Well, geez, we've got products for that that have been tested and other tests that need to be done. Um, they're looking for you know decontamination on a massive scale for the ground, the water, the air, uh, the three major aspects of everything we do in life. Um, so, I mean, there's huge opportunities there as well. Plus, we've got government grants and so on that's happening now with, uh, with both um, recovery for Fort McMurray and there's uh, other grants through, through other agencies and so on, other monies being liberated. So there should be an opportunity somewhere there to, to respond and, and come up with uh, tests and systems that, that might work more efficiently than what are currently out there. There's also the concept of the tuned materials magnet. Um, like for arsenic, for example, if we could come up with the, the proper mixture for a magnet for arsenic, you just draw it right out of the environment. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. It could be spraying on a, some sort of GANS uh, material rather than this uh, concrete sort of stuff that immobilizes the ash, but it doesn't do anything to actually remove the uh, the materials from it. They still have to bring in the uh, 
the guys in the overalls and respirators and the full coverage in order to clean up these uh, burnt areas. And there's yeah, special because, agencies. You know, uh, I've got a group in down in Peru that are working with uh, uh, SWAS, you know, 10,000 acres that's contaminated with mercury from... Uh, um, from the old mining operations exactly. and they've been running to me going, we know you can make a magnet make a magnet tell us how to do this and I, I I'm driving me crazy because I can't help them I don't have the tech well I don't even know where thing exactly is happening up in uh, northern Alberta was it or is it Saskatchewan the native reserve or no it's, mm -hmm. uh, Manitoba or maybe Ontario is native reserve that's got high mercury and it's been that way since the 1960s from the uh, uh, mill that was there. And it's not going away. In fact, it's getting worse. And they're having birth yeah. defects and all kinds of issues. And it's a massive cleanup. It'll, they figure it'll cost $25 million and they don't know if that's gonna clean it up. And uh, they have to clean up the entire river system, try to get it at source. and. It's gotten into the silt and down into the, now they don't want to disturb it. This is the, the rationale of the, the government is, uh, first they didn't want to deal with it and thought it would just go away and you know, flush out on its own. And now since it didn't flush out, it's built up in the sediment, they don't want to disturb the sediment because that'll release it into the environment and make the situation worse. So yeah. due to the inaction, now they can't take action in a way. But um, this is where maybe, you know, the Keshe Foundation can uh, get a foot in the door and uh, be able to, uh, um, you know, with the, the right contacts, we might be able to do some testing and, and find out if some of the products we have are actually more effective than what's available on the market. Yeah. Yeah, um, Armand, if, if there's a group in the foundation that's working on, on, the, on that type of uh, cleanup process, can you get them to get a hold of Rick or myself so we can uh, at least offer some sort of help to these people? Because they like that. There's there's hundreds of thousands of people that are that are affected by this, and if we can solve it easily, um, I think we have a duty to do so. I really don't know uh, the groups that they are working on it, but uh, I know that. You know, uh, the people that we are working with, they want to present this to our American government for cleanup. Uh, um, I, like I say, I've got, a, I've got a, a large group down in Peru that's ready to move ahead as soon as we can offer them the technology. And they've got financial backing to make it, make it happen right away. So if they're looking for a test bed, I can offer them a massive, huge test bed. Okay. Um, can I come in? We have a meeting with them on Zoom. That would be perfect. Thank you. Didn't the Fukushima? Hello, everybody. Um, didn't the Fukushima tests? Didn't they turn the mercury into gold using the CO two water? It's not, it's not mercury. It's cesium. Ah, oh. uh, okay. But there was mercury. Is, is wasn't there mercury involved in that somewhere? No. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, if I recall, if I recall, Mario, what what Mr. Cash mentioned the first time this came up when he was describing it was that it's entirely possible to make a magnet for cesium, and you simply put them in the ocean and they suck the cesium right out of the water, and then it moved on to actually treating the 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 source of the waste, and that's where they're at now. And it's it's this this magnet that I'm interested in because we can't you know when we're when we're dealing with you know, 100,000 acres of contaminated land, uh, we can't process the land. We have to have something that will work over, over extreme distances. And I, if I recall what Mr. Kesh was saying about the original cleanup of the cesium, that's exactly how these work. It creates a magnet and it just draws it in from miles away. This is the reactors which, which are going to come in play. Right. Yeah. This next stage that all we do right now, we use steel matter to, uh, you know, convert the fields. Right. Later on, we will use the fields to create the environment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I can, I can see the concept. I can see how it would function, but I don't even know where to start to make it happen. So 
Um, I need somebody who's smarter than me to step in. Right now, the Gans energy is more sufficient, which we see it. You know, which we can make a mixture and let's say clean up lots of radioactive waters, you know, just let the water to just go through the Gans. Mm -hmm. But how would you do that with, with uh, say, a thousand acres of sand? That's why it's going to come, uh, you know, to play the uh, reactors, which you can set up in that territory, which will do the job. Right. Okay. Yeah. You don't need to have a gas and water, and you just can set it up the reactors in parameters, let's say in several miles, that they can, can clean up the whole territory. Or what would even be better is if we could just add a proton to it and turn it all into gold. <laughs> then you can use to convert to other material. Certainly. There is no waste in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> no, and there's there's really no destruction in the universe either. There's conversion from one thing to another, that's all. One thing to another. So slowly we'll come to that point that we'll set it up reactors for our all needs. There was talk, someone mentioned um, converting mercury into gold to um, a process using uh, you microwaves. Do, you can do different, you can, you have see, you know, uh, uh, if you have a box and uh, your CO2 box, you can, you, you can create a flow through it here. <clears throat> see over here? This is all my CO2 box. There is a hole here. And there is a hole here. So I have a pump. Which all the uh, hoses are nano-coated. So what I'm trying to do This plasma, this, this box holds plasma, and it's CO2 field mostly in a copper field. So if you pass the air through it, you know, you create a flow. Now your medium is air, not water. Correct? <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, one other question, just a clarification. Um, is it correct to assume that to contain the fields, we put them in a nano-coated uh, environment, and to dissipate the fields, we put them in a plain matter environment? Is that, cor is that matter, correct? Matter, matter absorbs, correct? Okay. You remember we had the old boxes and we never continue it. Uh, Diamond shape. Which I don't, don't remember. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. We created that for a purpose. It has never been continued, so we just stopped it for a moment. Oh, your two bucks. See, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. The shape for it. Yes. Diamond shape. Yeah, I, I, you're trying to make a crystal, is that right, Armin? We try to make everything. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But to, to contain, if you're making the CO2, that's carbon. I was looking at the structure of it. I mean, I can't help but looking at my reactor array that it's a crystal inside a crystal inside a crystal, which is exactly what a diamond structure is, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to contain the CO2 um, with fields so that instead of it being free floating in the water, it will uh, crystallize. Is that right? Is that the right idea? Yeah, correct. Because in the air, air is your medium too. You can create okay. same condition what in the water you are creating, same condition you can create it in the air. But then you still in have to environment. Control. Let me put it this way. <clears throat> environment. You are wherever you are, that's your environment. Correct? If you have a box of you know plastic box closed plastic box that's your environment so in your environment you created a field of co2 so if you pass the air and let's say you pass the poison air to other end what air it will be can you clean up when you pass through the box. Right, it should do the same thing as it's doing with Fukushima or whatever, it'll yeah. decontaminate it or whatever, sure. right? Now you're doing with the air. Right. Air like water, but in different state. You have hydrogen in air, you have everything in air, what you have in the ocean and on the landscape. You're making me want to spray down the screen of my uh, cooling fan with CO2 GANs now. <laughs> uh, it leads him here. This is different. I'll but in order to get, create the crystals, the, the, the hard, the matter level crystal, look you at still this. have to it. Look, at this. look at this one. If I fill up uh, water, half of the water of any mixture of GANs, and you breed it, you breed the field of it. Do any mixture and you breathe. It's an instant transfer. That's a whole new use for a bong. Yeah. It's I'm telling you. Because but you you put a mixture of gas water over there, the field, you breathe it. Because you bring the air to the water of the gas. So that air you breathe is gonna contain whatever mixture you put in a the water medium. Okay, but I'm still interested in if I need to make a crystal matter level crystal for my reactor. Mm -hmm. How do I contain the fields to uh, just in a plastic bucket is not going to be enough to contain the fields. I have to do well, something. Well, finish up. I'll let you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when I finish up, I'll let you know. I'll say it. Okay. Okay. I've been trying. I've been trying to do some experiments and not not getting anywhere really. I mean, I made okay. well, Mario. Mario grow in the air, correct? Sorry. Crystals grow in a you know in a under the ground. Let's say. Yes. So so you see it. It grows. So how you can create a condition which you have to contain it. But you need the flow, flow of the air. If you have an air in there, so it's, a, it's, a, it's still going to convert the CO2 into the matter level. As you see, it's done doing in the water. Now the medium is changed, water become air. So, but you still need the flow of the air. Okay, so you need to pump air through it, basically, or just I'm leave I'm trying it. to understand myself. Okay. Also, uh, Mario, you've been working with this grid system for quite some time. Um, perhaps the, the points of intersection of the fields of the grid 
are the actual container points, you might say. The, the, your grid is the fields, the overlapping fields become the container, in effect. And you well, use this grid exactly that shows the overlapping have. fields. So, in effect, you have all the points there, perhaps, of, of where the, um, the Coulomb barrier would be and so on. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking at with the with looking at the diamond structure. It looks like my reactor. I was thinking maybe I can contain the fields on the inside one by putting some kind of Gantz or nanomaterial in the second pyramid, so to speak, because that way, yeah, it, it, it's where the points of the of the crystal are. But it's still dealing with. Uh, I'm just not I'm not sure what how to do that actually. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have your nanomaterial. What is your nanomaterial made of? Well, matter plus the crystal. No. Crystal. One minute, one minute. Hello. Hello? Hi, John. It's meeting you. Okay, sorry. Hello? Hello? Hi. Just tell me you love her, Mikey. That's from a movie. <laughs> what your question was i'm sorry well uh, to contain the crystal mm -hmm. the, the you need to contain it somehow with fields so i mean uh, rick was saying like the reactor i have is a crystal inside a crystal inside a crystal what you got there okay. here here is the box right. we, know we created co2 in here okay so it carries the field of the CO2. Because it's been nano-coated a long time ago, and it's been GANS coated. If you see, you still have a GANS inside. What kind of GANS? It's a CO2 box. Okay, okay. This one you see, it's a copper plate which was attached a little bit. That's why you see a copper particles in here. But this one is in CO2. So we have a, we have a, uh, already carbon structure in here in a plasmatic condition. If we create a flow of the air, so what's going to be created in the box? Is it possible? I tried putting a little ball, I, I filled it with, uh, I, I nano coated it, and I filled it with uh, liquid CO2, and then I emptied it. And I put that in a container that I had made CO2 with. I thought that might be enough to draw. No. Create. Yeah, it's not. It didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> well, there is a there is an idea there though about seed crystals. Um, that's how they create these giant uh, diamond crystals. They use a a pure tiny wee seed crystal, and they can grow diamonds inside a vacuum chamber, for example, with deposition. Um, they can grow giant twenty centimeter single crystals of uh, of carbon uh, diamond by using a seed crystal to start with. So what about that in terms of a CO2 GANS or the seed crystal of the water of the GANS perhaps to start um, the CO2 no, in a kit? that nanostructure, Rick. Mm -hmm. Because with... nanostructure, nano, let's say of the carbon, let's say uh, of the graphite, you can make a nano, I, I made, you know, nanomaterials from graphite. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, graphite powder, but you know, you can, I have a graphite list. Yeah. Well, that's basically diamond, isn't it? In a, I mean, graphite, is a, graphite is a diamond, a different structure. Yeah. It's like layers and layers. It's about, so it's, a, it's a SP2 though, not the SP3. SP2, but right. not SP3, but the base is carbon. Right. But you can change it into SP3 by certain right. processes. You could uh, put that you in can. a vacuum chamber and with some high voltage and zap it and vacuum it and it would But you can do the diamond. same uh, with, uh, you know, bringing to the Gantt state and bringing it to nano state. Mm-hmm. Because through nano, you transfer to matter. Mm -hmm. Look, it's a field, it's a GANS, it's a nano, it's a matter. Mm -hmm. 
if you have a nano, that means it's a, if you apply plasma, it will change because still it's in a plasmatic condition. We so, separate from the matter, it becomes we separate it to nano, then separate it to gas. Now it's the same way you bring it back. If yep. you have a nano, I think a nanoparticle of the seed, then you can grow on it. Because always you can see when you look to the diamonds, you can see that seed. Mm -hmm. That's what I've heard, yeah. Always. Then, you know, the cutters, diamond cutter, it's a rough diamond, you can see the seed. And then the cutters cut the way that they don't touch the seed. If they touch the seed, they lose the whole uh, color. <laughs> Mm hmm right, yep. So they they be very careful. They open a window before they, you know, do any cuts on a diamond. They open a window, then they can look at it. They can see. Where is the seed is there, then they can cut around it, or they can cut the way that they don't touch it. Well, it sounds to me like I have basically the right idea with the seeding with the CO2, it's an empty ball now. So that should be a container. Maybe if I leave it for a few months or something, it might, you know, I'm leaving tomorrow, I'll come back in a few months, I might find a diamond in the middle of the, the ball or whatever, but... Uh, you have to create a condition. Yeah, first... You have to, uh, why are you, you going to crystallize it, without air? Yeah, you assume it's empty, but it's not empty at all. It's, it's got air in it, but whether it's got the right... Uh, no, not enough. You right. see that the fields for when the CO2 you, in it. Because I, when because you I, use I, CO2, you, when you don't change the water on door, add the water in time, your CO2 will stop to produce. It's correct because you use all the molecules of the, you know, uh, uh, air in a water. So that's why uh, the process is slower and slower. But if you change the water right away, you bring the same you know, production rate. But it should be the same thing with the air. You don't need to change it because it's constantly in the air. There'll be the oxygen in the air constantly. But if right? you have a chamber, in that chamber, you need to create the flow. Is it possible? I was thinking about putting a copper plate underneath the container to create a, a yeah. dynamic flow. No, that might yeah. no, no, it depends. It's what going the wrong mean? way. Now, if you, have, if you look at it, this is totally nano-coated box inside. Right. Okay. So if I impose another field, it depends from which side. So you can create different materials, but you need the air. You need the flow. You have to have moving air. So we just you, you, matter level air. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then that should contain it inside the container because it's nano coated. You get yeah, a when they touch, they oxidize. So what happens then? It's the same thing. You create still, you create the CO two in there, but you know now you have an air for oxidization. Okay. Maybe you have CO two crystal <laughs> falling down. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Angel dust, well, you remember? The fairies, they have a dust, you know, spraying. Well, here's a way that um, some scientists did something. Let me do a screen share here. I wanted to show something that's interesting that came up recently. Guys, I am so sorry. I got to leave for half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. But I'll be back. If you will be online, I will join you. Soon. Okay, thank you, Armin. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Armin. Thanks for your information. Appreciate it. Uh, let me just throw this on here. Uh, where are we? Here we are. Okay, this is um, an article that came up, uh, like dated back to February of 2016, and this is scientists uh, guide gold nanoparticles to form diamond super lattices diamond in quotation marks and when we talk about diamond when Kesh talks about diamond he actually often uh, indicates that it's the sp3 
uh, type structure, meaning the, the tetrahedral structure, not necessarily diamond, the material diamond itself. So anyways, these guys, uh, it shows a, a great picture here that I'd like to bring up, which is they, they actually use DNA bundles to create a tetrahedron cage and then they insert gold nanoparticles into the center of this cage and onto each vertice of the cage. So they form this diamond lattice from the gold nanoparticles that are held in place by the DNA bundles. So all this sounds kind of <coughs> crazy and complicated in a way, but it's actually not that complex of an operation to to uh, do this apparently it's not like they use tweezers and pull out each of these DNA strands to line these up and so on it's more or less a self-assembling type of arrangement um, <clears throat> I thought it was interesting that um, they were using DNA to create the structure of of uh, uh, this nano nano uh, particle structure, nano structure, um, um, using essentially amino acids. When you think about it, DNA, amino acids, uh, and we do have amino acids that are part of the CO2 kit and other uh, arrangements of our plates and so on that can generate the oils that we see on the surface. And Kesh keeps telling us how we can use these amino acids. And I'm wondering maybe that they could be used for this kind of, uh, this kind of situation to create the structure for uh, other processes to, to take place to, to end up with some sort of uh, special surface or special um, plasmatic lattice essentially diamond lattice with the right spaces in between to create that plasmatic interface um, it seems like it could be done I know that they do create um, certain kinds of gold nanoparticles from amino acids on the surface of, of uh, liquids like water and other types of things can be created, different chemical combinations can be created from the surface, the interaction of the surface of a fluid and the fluid itself with the, uh, the air or other gases that are introduced above it and so on. So I thought I'd throw that in as a possibility. I mean, you look at the structure, that tetrahedron, and if it's that tetrahedron is the basis for your structure and your structure looks like a tetrahedron when you're done like like yours does uh, Mario uh, it's a tetrahedron within a tetrahedron within a tetrahedron actually then uh, why not start with the tetrahedron to begin with to replicate on the micro and nano and macro level as well so maybe you would have a tetrahedron spaceship when you're done or a tetrahedron healing chamber or whatever um, particular thing you were creating at the time. They did not create new gold. They just realigned it in uh, nano, nano layers, basically. Is that correct? I think, yeah. Th that's right. It's a caged nanoparticle. It wouldn't even be a single um, atom of gold, necessarily. It could be, a, a, you know, 30 or 50 atoms together forming a, a particle. And, but the thing is, when uh, a substance such as gold in particular, when it's in that nanoparticle state, it has entirely different tendencies than it uh, than it would as the element gold. It no longer uh, responds in the same way. Uh, you can get um, certain kinds of gold nanoparticles. You can get uh, um, uh, magnetic effects from that you can't get from the regular gold element, and so on. Uh, um, there's all kinds of different things that gold nanoparticles can do. For example, they interact with the UV rays of the um, atmosphere of the sun, actually, 
and instantly neutralize pollution air particles. Um, they've, they've discovered this with, I've, I've mentioned this before with, um, we're getting some interference here with somebody's microphone open. Maybe, perhaps yours, Mario. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mentioned this before with gold nanoparticles that uh, were used in the Middle Ages to make uh, stained glass windows in churches. And it turns out the red color, they actually create, created back then gold nanoparticles that form the color red when they're of the proper size. The, the red color is an indication literally of the size of the nanoparticle, the gold nanoparticle. And they use that as the stain for the glass in the glass and stained glass windows. And it turns out uh, they've recently discovered that when the sunlight goes through those stained glass windows, the, the um, gold nanoparticles are activated and any uh, pollution uh, molecules that are nearby that window will, will get instantly annihilated from the... Um, uh, because what happens with the interaction of the... the um, um, the uh, ultraviolet with the gold particle changes the oxygen into a free radical state and the free radical oxygen atom is known to be able to rip apart virtually any uh, molecule that's nearby uh, such as pollution and so on and so essentially it um, ionizes the, uh, the um, oxygen in the air just from the size of the gold uh, nanoparticle it wouldn't do it if it was just a gold color or I mean a, a gold in the element state it has to be in that nanoparticle and a, and a particular size of nanoparticle in order for it to do all that action so that's how this kind of lattice might be useful maybe it maybe this kind of lattice could pass air through but it would neutralize any um, any pollution particles in it, for example. Maybe we could use our, our, uh, our amino acids to create a, a diamond lattice that, um, I don't know, is particularly useful for our own health uh, pens or health uh, pads or something like that as well. Does it, does it mention how it was uh, created? Hi, Rick. This is Mark from Detroit. Hey, Mark. How you doing? Um, let me see. They employed a technique where they uh, organized the nanoparticles into 3D spatial arrangements using the rope-like bundles of double helix DNA to create the rigid three-dimensional frames, and they added dangling bits of single-stranded DNA to bind the particles coated with the complementary DNA strands. Um, so they, they basically uh, made a scaffold. I'm not sure how they actually created the uh, DNA, how they got the DNA bundles to make this, this uh, pyramid structure. Would, uh, would it be in a, like a liquid form where they would be looking at it through? I'm not clear on that actually. They usually use uh, what they call a, 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 a scaffold which is basically, um, it could be um, silicon uh, oxide or some other type of substance that the, they can etch or make into little uh, uh, regular um, you know, uh, uh, shapes. And that when, when the, uh, in this case the DNA, well maybe they'll say something about it here. Uh, I mean, they talk about how they how they get the gold into the DNA strands. They, the gold has got two different uh, DNAs attached to it, and depending on if it's a single strand or double strand, the, the double strand will go into the center of the caged, of the tetrahedron cage, and the other one will the single strands are on the vertices of the cage. So the single strand gold it gets automatically attached to the vertices of the of the cage so you have your um, your gold that way locks into place one in the center according to its uh, 
um, attraction and the other one's at the vertices according to their attraction. I'm not sh what's not clear to me is how they actually got the cages to uh, uh, to be made to start with. Uh, well, those are two golden particles right there, the, the green one and the red one? Yes. And these so, have different uh, DNA bundles attached to them. Well, wouldn't that be the same thing that um, um, we just learned last week from um, Armin, who said take two gold plates, two gold plates, nanocoat one, and leave one raw, like those two are of positive and negative, right? Which mm -hmm. would create that structure. Wouldn't it create? That's what I'm thinking, right? Well, in our, we in might our box be... or our, in our little in experiment. I'm not sure if it's going to create a tetrahedron cage out of the, you know, uh, DNA gold that would be in there. Gold you know, on gold. For example, if you spit into your, um, uh, into your uh, gold and gold um, kit, um, you know, nano, uh, 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 Gans creation kit, is that going to mean that they're going to automatically take these gold particles and put them inside a tetrahedron cage? I don't think so. But on the other hand, there are certain things like that that do automatically line up and do automatically, auto magically, basically um, set themselves up and into these arrays. These these what they call a super lattice. It's quite quite interesting. Now they mention this lattice um, is very. It's the same arrangement as the carbon atoms in a lattice of diamond, but it's at a scale about a hundred times larger. So that's interesting. It's quite a, a range. You could imagine other particles other than gold nanoparticles in this scale of one to a hundred times larger, let's say, than than the the diamond lattice, but still in that same diamond type lattice, diamond like lattice you might say. You know I was looking at that if if when I hear like they say single strand and double strand I'm just imposing magrav if if um, the single strand is actually magnetic fields and the double strand is actually magnetical and gravitational they put the, the double strand, which has both, in the middle. That's holding the single strands, which are actually magnetical. So you have the magnetical on the outside. Then you have a magnetical and a gravitational on the inside. So that's, in effect, holding the, the structure in place. Wow, that's I, pretty insightful uh, thinking there. Yeah, I could see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like they're doing exactly what we're trying to do to create structure, a crystal containing the fields somehow. So that's mm -hmm. interesting that they have magnetical fields on the outside and uh, I mean, if that's correct, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> but. Well, uh, you, you meant, yeah, you, well, in a way, um, I mean, we look at the double strand DNA, it's the two, uh, um, two independent strands that are you know, wound in together, basically, it's very similar to the way that Mr. Kesh draws the spiral uh, uh, magrav drawing, you know, of the magnetical and gravitational lines and so on. So, yeah, that's an interesting uh, way to look at it. So the answer is there, probably, right there. We're looking at how to contain the fields. Still don't have it, though. Well, I mean, we, we've looked at this tetrahedron uh, concept now for quite some time uh, in terms of, you know, like four reactors set up for, the, for each of the vertices of the tetrahedron or for, uh, we, we, we talked many times about the free plasma that's created in the center of this uh, tetrahedron. Um, yeah. And we see that you know represented by this caged gold particle essentially, but um, this this tetrahedron is such a, a core uh, principle type shape. It's it's the it's the first it's the most primary shape that's in three dimensions, 
it, it, it's taking a triangle, uh, a flat two-dimensional object and, and flipping it up uh, to become three-dimensional to give it uh, that ability to um, take up what we call space and so on. And that that seems important that that is the I mean you could have a four-sided uh, pyramid for example or you know a four uh, pointed uh, would have five uh, vertices basically uh, a pyramid instead of four but that would be more complex this is the simplest most basic shape that pops up this this is the same you know the triangle and tetrahedrons and so on is the basic shapes of uh, the images in video games and so on to, to, to build up three-dimensional shapes and so on it's a, it's a primary very basic geometric um, principle and so it will apply to many different aspects of the universe and this is one of them perhaps there's other ways that we can use the same principle as well but I think that the idea that it's a uh, scalar and can reflect up into higher and higher levels such that you know shapes such as uh, such as we've used for for uh, the separate uh, reactor setups like we've mentioned and, and different uh, tetrahedral shapes is got got to be important it's got to be you know uh, the, the basic principles there all the way up yeah well the flower of life drawings everything is a tetrahedron if you draw straight lines it, from everywhere you can connect you can find equal sided uh, uh, uh tetrahedrons everywhere um I mean, it's to me, it's an optical illusion seeing the straight lines. We see them as crystals. They're actually spherical because the fields curve. But if you connect them with straight lines, that's what Pythagoras did, basically. You know, he's the one who came up with the Pythagorean theorem using the harmonic overtones, oddly enough, the monochord, to get mm -hmm. the Pythagorean theorem, you know? So that's definitely the basic structure of life. Of everything, uh, the amino acid is a tetrahedron, right? Yes, right, and uh, many of the basic, um, what is it like? Um, um, let me see. There's, uh, I think it's eth, like ethyl and methyl, and uh, um, some of the more basic ones. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, such as acetylene uh, is a very basic um, um, sort of tetrahedral structure as well. And that's what we find out in the universe, apparently, as some of the most basic particles are that tetrahedral shape. It's very solid, uh, uh, stable type of shape. You can see the other, some of the links at the end of this paper to other things, interesting titles such as DNA double helix does double duty in assembling arrays of nanoparticles. Scientists use nanoscale building blocks and DNA glue to shape 3D super lattices and so on. It's, it's all about using DNA as, as a assembler to assemble these arrays and you know, it's um, it's it's sort of a no-brainer in a way. It's like why would you try to use tweezers and uh, you know uh, uh, electron microscope to move these little uh, um, nanoparticles and try to line them up and to erase it? Just does, it won't happen. It's too too massive of a job and too beyond our capabilities. But to allow something to naturally create these arrays of nanoparticles something that we already have such as dna that that seems like a great uh, uh, it's just a, an elegant way to do things and i think that that's somehow it makes sense to me that um, dna is going to get involved in um, 
in creating some of these arrays of nanoparticles that we use. And I mean, it is already. We 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 uh, give blessings to our our configurations, to our reactors, to our GANs, and so on. And we put our actual DNA into it. You can't help it. Every time you touch a container, your fingerprints are in it and on it and become part of it. And our breath, we're breathing on these units and into them. Uh, we become part of this uh, living entity, um, especially the certain types of GANS materials that are more closely re related to our emotional um, aspects and, and uh, spiritual aspects and so on. So essentially we're using our DNA and all of our knowledge which is embedded in our DNA as well to create the structures that we already are creating anyway. Why not go a, a level deeper and actually use our DNA substance to to create those structures it kind of makes sense in a way do you think it's necessary to actually use the dna not just the amino acid because it's basically the same thing isn't it i mean without all the information but i mean as a as a frame for a lattice you already have it there so they're using dna because they don't understand about the simplicity of amino acids the way you catch people do well, the thing is, they're assembling an array rather than individual nanoparticles. So perhaps it it requires a, a more complex uh, structure in order to uh, assemble an array, as opposed to uh, um, you know just making one nanoparticle. Oh yeah, yeah, I see. see. And they they actually use they use the. Uh, double and single uh, strands to as a binding factor as well because it's it's a an easy an easy procedure nowadays to attach i'm getting some feedback from your speaker uh, oh, sorry. Someone there. Um, um, it's an easy thing relatively easy thing these days to to make you know any school kid now can make dna they you know you can spit and you, there's a couple of chemicals you use or something and you can make your own DNA at home no no problem and uh, so it's becoming more and more common to attach DNA in a, in a lab process to different uh, uh, particles as markers and as tests and so on so they can actually attach their choice of double or single DNA to these gold particles in this in this case um, so you know, they, they, there's one sentence there that kind of says it all. Multi-component nanostructures with tunable, tunable optical properties. <coughs> Switchable nanostructures. So they're talking about making these very precise, tunable, switchable structures. Um, I mean, it seems like it'd be great if we could have uh, some... DNA coding on our coils that was able to switch some aspect on and off on it to, to you know, multiply the plasma and make it into a, an optical instrument rather than a uh, electrical instrument, for example, through. Rick, yeah. Could I ask you? Would your could you find your own personal DNA in your toenails and in your hair? Yeah, that would be one place that uh, definitely uh, DNA is found. In your hair and toenails. Yep, I'm, yeah, it's got protein, it's got uh, DNA. That's one, they use hair samples to, uh, um, you know, uh, in crime, uh, crime scene things and so on. To If they have a hair, they've got a sample of DNA essentially and they can trace that back and so on. So, so if we Same. made a personal gants of our own hair and nails, which I'm trying to do, watch what, well, I'm just getting started, but you, the things that we you're talking about now are things I've been thinking about for a while, and that's what I thought. Like Armin said, if we could make a gants, we, you can make a gants of anything, really. So if we took, if you took, I thought, to take the top of your hair from the core, right from your core, 
where you you know the middle of the top of your head and all your clippings of your fingernails from the ends of your fingers the clippings from the end of your toes made a gans of it that's you that's you now in there yeah and then what do you do with you once you've made you that's well, the question not, well, what would again, you what would you like to be done with you once you were made well once again i'm still yeah. i'm working towards a personal uh personal starcraft a, a craft that's going to provide something for me mm -hmm. uh, a unit i want a unit that's going to first of all provide me here on this planet right now this day as fast as i can get to uh protection from the elements that are trying to invade me so if i made a personal protection that knew me which i'm trying to that's my all that's what i'm really that's my goal right now is to try to make something that's going to know who I am. Well, we're, all, we're already in, in a way you have created our, our body as a protection um, for our essence or our, our being. Yeah, but I can't, I can't project, um, I can't make a force field around me to keep um, um, nuclear uh, fallout or uh, pollution to come in around me or my family or my home. So... I think that that is the uh, would be a nice uh, harmonious field to build around, starting with me, and then my house, my family, and then outward projecting. That would be a that would be my personal goal right now. That's one of my goals is because when I first start, when we first started, uh, Mr. Kesh, uh, Caroline, uh, Mr. Kesh's wife said. Become personal with the with all your systems, whatever you start with. She said, mm -hmm. work, uh, put yourself into it. And then you got to think, well, when we first started, we were so novice. We cut our hands. We knocked the uh, copper. We broke it, cut it. You know, now, we're, like you said, we're intimate with this. Our fingerprints are on it. And we've already gone to a second level, third, fourth, fifth level of this now. But I still try to go back to the basics and like she said if you're going to start something start it from the beginning where the water that you create that's going to start the gans which is going to start everything is the salt water and i put my feet in salt water uh the himalayan salt water i heat the water up real hot as hot as my feet can get it to where my when i take my feet out of it they're still red which i transmit my myself into that water I'm sure my cells uh, decompose my energy from my feet, my left foot from my right foot, or both. Everything's in that my foot bath, and I I make 15 gallons of that. Um, I, I have it all written down. I didn't write anything down before. I didn't know, even know any. I'm trying to make a standard. That's why I went and bought the I, on my Facebook. I put up today. I finally could afford a pH meter. Mm -hmm. Finally, a good one. Mm -hmm. Good. A, real, a digital one. <laughs> yeah. Mark. Yes. Can, I did an experiment last year with the. Hi, Mario. First, how are you doing, Mark? Good. When I first made the first reactor, when I was preparing the, uh, the Ganses, my gloves shredded and I had my amino acids in the, in the react, in the, the Gans. And I had a definite communication thing happening with the reactor. When we made a second set with Max, um, where there were no accidents and there were no basic amino acids, they made the ganses. It was their ganses, and they were very careful about everything. And there was no amino acids in it. And although I could feel the presence of the reactor, I mean, I was in it because I made the, the gans. I made, I prepared them, but I my gloves didn't shred or whatever. I, there was no direct amino acids in it. I could feel it, but I was not in the communication with it the way I was with the first reactor. So when I did the third one, I just put some saliva on a on a in a on a glass on top of the on top of the Gans container and made CO two and CH three. Uh, you know, transferred the fields, and I definitely had a direct connection with the reactor. So, I mean, just some saliva, you know, skin cells, whatever. As long as you get the, your amino acid into the GANS, 
you will have that connection. I mean, that was my experience, you know. And even though I, I made the, like we made the ganses, we prepared the, 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 the balls and everything, when I, when I assembled it, I mean, my hands were on it. I touched it with my hands, I, but it wasn't the same. So um, unless I directly put the amino acids in there, you know, I, I mean, uh, anyway. Well, Mark, which one, which one, uh, which experiment was the one that the ball went by? Oh, uh, well, actually both of them did, did that. But the first one, it was the first one. Yeah, they both, but later I had it in a container because I was nanocoding it. So they couldn't actually, but the, 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 it was the first one that actually the one flew out the window and, and all that, you know. But I mean, there was a lot of things happening. I didn't understand what was happening because much of it was happening. And then Mr. Kesh would explain things a month later and I would go, oh, is that what was going on? And then I still don't know. There's always other possibilities that could have been whatever. I mean, the thing was spinning, but why would it start to lift up after a month of spinning? All of a sudden now it's lifting up and sitting in the middle. You know, Mr. Kesh, like November said, all you have to do is put your three base reactors and put the top the top one in the middle and it'll position itself and things like that. I was like, oh, okay, maybe that was happening. But, you know, I didn't document it. I didn't get any videos of anything. I don't, you know, it's all memory and it gets confused and didn't know what was happening at the time, you know, and it's only later in retrospect. And it's, you know, it's, that's not a very scientific method to go by as an experiment. So it's hard to say really what any of this was, you know, I mean, I, I, since last year, I mean, I, I, I ultimately, I'm finally now coming to where I'm going, oh, okay, I'm believing it, but I, I, I alternated daily between, wow, this is really happening, and oh my God, I'm having a stroke, you know, um, you know, hallucinating, you know, I mean, I've gone through, I went through bird flu, you know, whatever, you know, and then, wow, this is really happening, you know, and then, no, it's not, I'm, you know, better go get a checkup, you know? So, you know, it's only now because so many others have had so many kind of similar experiences that I was like, you know, when Ali was showing the shimmers and stuff, you know, I was living in the, in the flat. When it first happened, it was not nearly as vivid. It was feeling and I could see, but when I was in back in Shanghai and had two of them going, I opened the door. I felt like I walked into water. You know, I mean, it was so thick in the air and stuff, you know. And when I was watching Ali, it was in January. I was, I forgot where I was, but, and he was like, wow, can, you, you know, describing it. I was like, oh, thank God I'm not going nuts, you know. Because at least Ali, he could say, you see it? You know, there's somebody else there. Yeah, you see it too? Yeah, okay, well, I'm not going nuts. But I'm not very room by myself, you know, thinking, what did I eat today? You know, so it was a lot of that. And I still don't know what to make of a lot of the stuff that was going on and still going on, you know, but anyway. Uh, well, Mario, okay. I'm right with you. I didn't know anything about this stuff. It's, I threw every, I, I collected a lot of stuff. I'm kind of mad now that I threw a lot of stuff away, but I'm glad I did because it made me learn about a lot of stuff, but I know exactly what you're saying. When I'd walk into my room and be like a different, like a feeling like, a like, you know, like when you, um, Look down a hot road and you see that that wavy um, heat coming off the road. That was it wasn't you couldn't see it, but you could almost feel like it was like oh oh. I'd I'd be like, man, what is going on here? And it, it kept on happening. You couldn't ask anybody. Well, who who would you ask? Who would you go to? What would you say? Would you tell you my neighbors, my friends? They're all like. Dude, are you crazy? Stop doing that stuff. Throw that stuff away. Blah, 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 blah. And I did, but I learned. It made me learn. You have to learn. If you experience and learn, and I'm very happy now. I'm, I'm 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 way beyond that point now, and I'm enjoying myself again. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's there's an old saying where they say, "Dude, it's all in your head." That usually means it's not true. But in this case, you know, if it's not all in your head, then it's probably not true. And so well, I'm, I'm 56 and I grew up in the 70s and I heard that my whole life. Dude, dude, it's not true. 
for, walk away, <laughs> you know, but it's in your head. But not really. It's real. There's a lot of real stuff that's happening. And then, and you can't uh, take that out of account. You have to take that into account for everything that's in our universe that's now going to start presenting itself to us. You can't freak yourself out and go like, oh, don't be stupid. Uh, don't be, um, I, I learned not to be closed-minded, put it that way. I, I'm learning a lot more and I'm very happy. And I, I used to get not scared. I, I, can't, I guess, well, when you're by yourself, you're scared, but you have friends now. And like you said, Mario, you went by, through it by yourself a year or so or two or three years ago. I went through it, you know, um, six months ago or four months ago, and many people will go through it and they'll see this video six months from now and they'll say, hey, I went through it too. And it's a personal thing that they all have to go through. We all have to go through it. And it's an enlightening thing. Well, you know, I've, I've, I've you know, you were saying that things are going to start presenting themselves to us. I, I was, you know, like the whole idea of the, which is an optical illusion, whether you look at the flower of life drawings with one eye or two eyes, and that humans and presumably the rest of the universe sees everything with one eye, that we're the ones that are seeing everything as an optical illusion. And the presence of these ganses is not going to make others present themselves to us. It's us coming out of the cave, so to speak, the allegory of the cave, and seeing things that have been there all along that we just blocked out of our minds or whatever, you know? And, and so it's more of an awakening for humans rather than others presenting themselves to us. We're going to start noticing things that we didn't notice before, that kind of thing, you know? And that's with the shimmering and, and all these things, being able to actually feel them, you know, is, is something, you know, there was, there was a guy, when I was going through this thing, I was like, am I going nuts? There was some guy, it was like November. He, 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 had, a, he had a Magrat power unit and he was, saying, um, he was saying, oh, he's getting these terrific results. He was on one of the workshops and, you know, and then he says, and I'm, I think it was happening at the time while he was online, he says, my daughter's saying, daddy, the reactor's talking to me. And I said, Are you? Hello, Mary. I guess it's always, it's always yeah. the best part. <laughs> Somehow the universe doesn't want us to hear that part, I guess. Mario, are you there? I see your microphone's open, but maybe, maybe we lost your line. Well, uh, Rick uh, Lee here. Let me run this one by you guys. Sure. What if you made a a, a carbon gant set of uh, graphite uh, from lead pencils? Uh, so you got your carbon graphite, or you got your carbon gants in a pot with uh, the Gantz water on top, and you got your fish pump uh, air blower blowing there in one side, and the hose going out the other side, so you're taking the vapor off the, off the, you should be getting uh, uh, vapor plasma coming off. Now you pump this into a second pot, which you've been using for making uh, uh, CO2, so you got the carbon fields inside the second pot. And you put a, a, say a graphene plate in the bottom, a plate that's got graphene on it. And I think graphene's a nano coating and that becomes a seed uh, place for diamonds to start. And I'm thinking you have to up the energy of the carbon uh, fields into uh, probably a, to get the diamond structure. And I'm just wondering if the fields in that uh, CO2 pot are enough to up the energy of the of the of the stuff you're blowing into the pot or maybe you got to add another maybe a reactor or a starship formation on top of this thing to 
to pump some energy back in the pot to to make diamonds. Any comments? Sounds like you're ready for next week's project to show us. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Well, <clears throat> have we been taught how to make crystals or diamonds yet, or in a structure? It, I, I I remember a, a, a lesson plan, but maybe it was a long time ago. Well, Kesh has talked about making crystals and so on lately, but um, not in terms of the specifics so much, more of the theory and the concepts involved. Well, when we first started, I remember him talking about um, how it, when he he would take a uh, nano-coated piece of copper, um, say 14-gauge wire, and he would um, nano-coat it and heat it and get it hot, hot with caustic on it and then put it in he he just said it was in a cold solution so i interpreted it as dry ice in a cooler so if you took a rod uh, a 14 gauge nano coated piece of copper got it as hot as you could get it dipped it in a caustic solution and then just set it in a cooler that had already had um, um, dry ice in it, which it would stay as cold as the dry ice would keep the cooler, which would start to crystallize on the piece of copper um, wire. I didn't, I, this was before I experiment, you know, this was just something I kept remembering that I, one of the experiments that I wanted to try to do and I never got a chance to do it because I got scared because I had so many experiments going on at one time that I remember him saying that um, get your um, get whatever wire, copper coated wire, hot as you can cop possibly get it. So I interpreted that um, I just was going to, I was just thinking just to hold it with a piece of, with a pair of pliers, get my torch, heat it up as, a, as like a son of a gun, dip it in caustic, dip, and then put it in my little cooler, and I got cooler pitchers, but uh, in the cooler, and then have the um, dry ice underneath it as cold as possible. I don't know how, or you could, I guess, if you wanted to. I, I, I'm thinking about how to do it as in a garage because that's the way I do stuff or in the basement. I'm not in a lab. So those two, he said, if you could get it to go fast from hot to cold, hot to cold real fast, the crystallization would start. So I thought, well, but I never had time to try it. So, but that was one of my experiments that I wanted to do. So if anybody wants to try it or I am going to try it, now that I've got things started again. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah, I'm not clear on that. Uh, I remember he mentioned, it was mentioned at one point about the heating up of copper wire. And then uh, some people were putting it into snow and, uh, and uh, uh, cooling it down really quickly. But most of the time when you do that, it tends to flake off the nano coating um, from the heating. You know, when you heat up copper, it creates that black nano coating. And, you, and if you shock it too quickly and cool it down too quickly, it tends to flake off in a, in a layer and chips come off kind of thing. And some people complain that that will contaminate your, your GANS material and so on. If you were to make plates that way and try to create the CO2 GANS, you'll get black little chips come off the plates because it's not a tight coating. It tends to be looser, flakes off. I've done experiments with pennies. I don't know if I have the pictures available. I'll show them if I do have it here. Um, you put a penny on a burner, heat it up, and you end up getting a, uh, a nano coating on it. Um, but the um, nano coating flakes off very easily if you were to put the penny into, uh, into um, a cold situation. No, I don't have my photo photos properly lined up here. I've got the wrong library. And I don't think I've got that. Let me have another look here. Where are we here? 
Oh yeah, there so it is. Do you there think the it. hot cold process like that is a good process or not? No, I don't think it's a good process for creating the nano coating. I think it. Okay. I think the hot is good, but it has to be more of a gradual uh, uh, cooling down process. Most of the time, when you make crystals, it's not a shock process. It's a, a gradual uh, accumulation and uh, a gradual process of um, of uh, coating. So. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rick. Uh, hi, Mark. Hi, Shandor. Hi. Uh, I'd like to mention here that such a specification that to get it as hot as you can, uh, that uh, I have a little problem with that because I can't get it as hot as to melt it. It that's depends on your uh, torch or uh, your heat source. That's right. So, uh, when you do uh, nano coating by heat, that works fine if you don't overheat it. Uh, when uh, you heat a copper wire with a torch flame, you have to follow it uh, to heat it up uh, to the temperature where you see the colors of the copper are changing. And the best is when uh, it is at uh, the color of shiny gold, but not more hot. If you get it hot red, it will nano coat, but it will uh, all flake off immediately after that. It will not be the stable one. Yeah, that's but, uh, it's, true. It's, it's the skill, uh, like like uh, the painting uniformly with a paint spray. It yeah. really, really, really takes uh, some uh, pieces of copper broken uh, uh, before to make a good one. So that's an art. Uh, uh, by the way, I'd like to show you something before the sunshine moves. I uh, had I made some. Uh, I want to see my video somewhere. Okay, it's black right now. Ah, uh, I have to plug it in. Ah, okay. Okay, it will go. Uh, I have to plug it into the camera. camera. Okay, now we oh, see something fine. there, yeah. So I made here some uh, uh, guns collecting things. Mm -hmm. And I have here the first harvest. And I'd like to show you something interesting. You see the floating bits here. Actually, the water is on the top, and here in the middle I have some floating bits, and they're down. I have some bubbles, and I have the gans. Yeah. The CH3. So now I'm spinning the bottle, and those are holding in place. Not those of the bottom, of course, but those who are floating here up. Hmm. And I'm bouncing it. Yeah. So they stay, like they stay there, they don't move up and down, uh, they don't float to the surface or to the bottom. Yeah. And do you have any salt water in there or is it just uh, distilled? Yes, it's, it's what I took it out uh, from uh, this. Okay. And here is the next one. This is the CO2. Also uh, some uh, floating uh, flakes. Hmm. And bouncing it a bit. Let them yeah. move, you see? I'll do like that. So if you were to put the distilled water in, they would probably not do that. They would go to the bottom, I, I would presume then. It's, it's due to some sort of All layering. possible. Maybe Archimedes, uh, Archimedes Law uh, plays its role here. And this is the copper oxide. Same thing. Interesting. It's almost like there's a, a layer of uh, heavier water in there. Heavier. Very good observation, Rick. Very good observation. I, I see you have been a magician, so you you know to see the essence of the things, not the appearances. Actually, what I did when I collected this, it was uh, quite cloudy, especially the CH3 and the, the copper oxide. And uh, in order to let it uh, to settle down faster, I put them into the freezer. Usually, if you leave oh. it for three, five minutes, it goes to the bottom much faster. But I have forgotten them there for a longer time, yeah. for a couple of hours, and all got frozen. Uh -huh. I want to say here, the salinity is only 5%, and my freezer is minus 21 centigrade. So even salty water can uh, freeze that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put them uh, on the desk here, and uh, by the morning it was uh, molted, melted. And actually, uh, what melts first, it's uh, that part of the water which uh, has more salt in it. 
and a bit and uh, such a big icebergs were uh, floating on the top by 3 a.m. and now it's uh, 8 a.m. so five hours ago and uh, now all has been uh, uh, molten but that means oh I see that uh, uh, it naturally made uh, uh, stratification layering. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. uh, probably I have to the bottom more salty water, yeah. and I have uh, not so salty water in the top because wow. I need steely. That's really cool. Really cool. That reminds me of a joke I heard a couple of days ago where these guys were um, stranded in the ocean and uh, on a raft, and they had no fresh water. They there was just you know ocean everywhere they could see, and they knew that if they were to drink the water they were going to die and uh, because of the salt and they were but they were dying of not having any water so eventually one of them uh, on the in their death throes decided to try to drink the water and he drank and went over off to the side and just drank and drank and drank and it turned out to be fresh water <laughs> Probably yeah, in same. some places it can separate. That's right, it can separate. Structurally in the deep oceans you have a bigger salinity than on the top. So you see also different life forms. Yes, right. You see how beautiful that is here. I'm spinning the bottle and they hold in place like some little uh, magnets, like, like a right, compass. Yeah. Now you haven't shaken the bottle since then. You spun it a bit, but you haven't actually done anything other than let it settle, right? Yeah. So let's uh, do something with this one. So we are the floating uh, bits. And here is the gans on the bottom. So I'm going to shake it a little, not too much, because otherwise it will take so much time. And we will see later how it uh, goes down. Yeah. You, you, if there will be up and down also, but it will take some, uh, some uh, one hour at least or something. So we'll come back to that. I put on, on my YouTube channel a short video about uh, this, and later I will put uh, after shaking how it will be. I'll be back like, in a second. I want to show you something like that. Andor, do you ever take a pH reading on any of your stuff? pH reading? What for? It's salt water with some, with some gas in it. I'm not much concerned about pH. No? No. Okay. And I have no pH meter. Another thing, uh, now uh, Mark asked me about pH meter. I have no pH meter, uh, but I have a, a gamma pix uh, program which uh, measures the radiation. So uh, this works with a camera on the uh, mobile phone. You can download it from the Google Apps. It's a gamma pix. Mm -hmm. And uh, What's interesting, just a second. You have to okay. cover. You, you, just a second. Okay. I have to go back to this program. And uh, here are the records. Uh, when it shows green, it means it's no radiation or very low levels. And when it gets yellow, it's, it's uh, quite high. You see. Uh, 287 microsieverts per hour. So the application works uh, by uh, counting the uh, pulses uh, through the camera. And for that, you have to uh, cover the camera. So I covered with a piece of aluminum foil and two layers of uh, black uh, tape. So I put the tape on this front camera. This is I'm using. I can still get, uh, take photos with the other camera. And what's interesting that suddenly I got such a uh, radiation levels. Look, 376 mi microsievert, uh, 432 microsieverts, etc. And just out of the blue. And here I made a measurement. This was uh, nearly one millisievert per hour. This would be the recommended dose for one year, not for one hour. It's quite a high. And that came off of your Gantz? No. Nothing uh, special near to the Gantz. 
but uh, I, I had a I had a thought that maybe because I am a smoker and I have some uh, tobacco here, I bought a, a tobacco which I never used before. It's a German. It said uh, without uh, additives, without chemical additives. Uh, this is what I use too. This is a uh, Virginia. It's a it's a roll your own. I don't want to recommend that to anyone. And uh, first, when I got that one uh, micro sieber, one milli sieber, so one thousand micro sieverts, actually nine hundred uh, ninety six, uh, nine hundred sixty six. I measured it near to this one, and I did a repeated measurement, and I said, "Wow, I've got a cheap isotope." <laughs> Actually, uh, the uh, the tobaccos very often have a high content of polonium two hundred ten and lead uh, two hundred ten isotopes. This is a natural process, they say. Yeah. Well, uh, in the U.S., the um, the tobacco must be grown in radioactive soil by law. Yes, it's this is the... made in Germany, so I don't know whether whether they imported the, the raw material from America. Usually, America imports the better tobacco from Europe, but I don't know. Uh, but uh, this morning I repeated, and it doesn't measure at all radioactivity. So maybe it happened something here in the environment, not because of my gans. Uh, so I moved far from my from the gans. I moved into the other room, I moved into the kitchen, which is, let's say, uh, six meters away. And uh, in, at certain hours, between 2.50 to 2.52, also I measured uh, such high radioactivity. It's very strange. You see, uh, this is measuring uh, such every uh, 12 minutes. Maybe it's from camp trailing. Are you close to a cell phone I have tower? No idea. So first I remarked on March 31st, uh, 16 hours, uh, when I had this in my pocket and I, I was outside, but I returned home. We've got a little rain, uh, but uh, after that I came home and this being in my pocket, it, it recorded the, uh, oh, I have, this is, this is doing really a, a big job. It's measuring, uh, monitoring constantly. So I can recommend these gamma peaks. Uh, this was some unclear measurement. And here it should be, you see. Here was first time when I noticed something. I had 16 hours and 19 minutes. It was a 466 uh, microsievert. Or 0 0.466 millisievert per hour. So sometimes I get radiation uh, suddenly and sometimes not at all. So this is very strange. Are, are we entering with our solar system approaching the Magellan cloud, which is radioactive or what, what the heck happens? So maybe it's a, it's a good idea to eventually purchase a reliable one because this, uh, what I have here, it's uh, uh, not calibrated for my camera model, so it may be higher or lower, actually. But still, it's, it shows a difference. So maybe it's not reliable, the measurement for its volume. It may be plus, minus, I don't know, 50% or who knows. But I see uh, such a changes, which are very strange. So suddenly, uh, in the night, it comes some radiation, and then it goes away. And we have no X-ray machine, or uh, nobody is uh, welding uh, in the night time. What about uh, could a cell phone tower do that? I wonder. Or a they have no radioactivity. This is measuring uh, actually ionizing uh, ionizing uh, radiation. Do you have a smoke detector in your house? No. And we have no gas. Is the there? Uh, is there a? Uh, Small detectors have a, America, I know. Do you have a nuclear uh, facility nearby? It's very strange. So maybe, maybe I should contemplate to get a better uh, radiation meter and to, and to get some uh, 
monitoring about what what happens because you see if i if i think that oh maybe it's this one i put it there it measures something then i put something else it measures something but it's not from this one and then it's not from the probe it's just from the environment because i measured in the other room also they didn't brought those maybe i have to measure my own lungs maybe they are at 18 too or who knows well that's the thing maybe you're measuring your own body because it it ends up our bodies are good if you want to measure yes, radiation we measure the, uh, human body. about 14 15 or 20 microsieverts or eight microsieverts but not not uh, hundreds of microsieverts mm -hmm. is it possible that is it possible that the the ganses you have you have reactors going are giving readings that your that the the device is misreading mm. that so the device, it counts uh, uh, the uh, photons which go through the camera while the camera is completely obstructed. By the way, I have shaken this uh, before. You remember this, uh, this to still have the floating pieces and this which I shaken. So I mix the different waters. I mix uh, the uh, salt water with the not salt water. And now it's, it looks different, you see? So I think Archimedes law uh, has a say into these uh, beautiful things here. Yeah. Yeah. Bando, have you ever tried a um, application for the Tesla field? Tesla field? Yes, there's an application you can get for Tesla. Tesla. Ah, uh, you mean the magnetical? Yes. Yes, unfortunately that phone uh, has no magnetic uh, detector. Uh, this older model has it. This is a, 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 a it needs recharging because its battery it's it's old. I got so this that on a, my iPhone. A, this is the Galaxy Mini. This has a magnet detector. Uh, this new one, uh, I thought it's better, but yes, it's better, but it has no uh, no compass function, no magnetic detector or detail detector. So when I'm looking at the Google Maps, uh, I have to guess in which direction is north. And to put it uh, accordingly, it doesn't uh, doesn't uh, get the, into the position uh, by itself. Okay, I have an Android. That's why. Yeah, so it depends of the hardware which uh, the uh, Android has. I mean, Android is the, uh, the operating system, but it it needs also a suitable hardware. Well, it seems to work. I downloaded the, but I just wondered if those apps work. I wanted to show. Um, we're looking at his CO2. This is some soap, which is just normal hand soap. Um, I get an unscented, you know, special non-reactive uh, uh, soap. And it's fairly clear, as you can see. So what I did is I put some CO2 GANs in it. And I've let it settle for two days. And this is it. It didn't settle. Zero. It doesn't mean zero settling interesting eh ah that's uh, not a full bottle it's ah it keeps in suspension yes so probably you you matched uh, their uh, gravitational magnetical fields in the balance i so i think that maybe the soap ends up uh, encapsulating the the gans uh, particles so that they end up separating um, uh, electrically or plasmatically yeah. soap, is, is, soap has the property to dissolve in water dirt yes mm -hmm. or for in matters so it, it's a very good for making an emulsion emulsion is when uh, you shake together let's say oil and alcohol and then you have mixed yeah I'm, a, I'm amazed I, I didn't I thought for sure when I first put it in, it was quite interesting. It it formed almost like a mushroom cloud inside, and it started to settle out in um in like a layer similar to your particles. But all the gans was like in a layer, probably about here, and then uh, it seemed to just sort of gradually. It didn't all suddenly dissipate into the whole. It was two different substances initially. And all I did was I just went like that. I didn't shake it up real hard. I just stirred it a bit like that. It went all white and it stayed that way for the last two days. I was amazed. So, so it's very good. So if you want to, to mix uh, gas to stay mixed with something, you have to add something, an emulsifier, such a tenzide. 
Yep, and it could be that soap is enough to, um, to uh, you know, maybe it only requires a, a drop of soap or something to allow the CO2 particles to expand out into their full, um, their full position from each other, their full uh, maximum potential. So yes, sure. It, it could have interesting effect uh, if it's for the copper oxide, for example. It could end up with maybe some kind of super capacitor out of soap. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, this thing when when uh, does not matter now for which reason, but when uh, there is such a uh, different uh, layering, many many people have shown things when. Uh, uh, they have a lot of gas up and a lot of gas down. It depends on what they did with it. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, there are some uh, dense conglomerates have a different energy level than the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So gas is, uh, how to say, a, a mixture of many... many um, yeah, and that might be a way that we can, we can uh, if separate. Particles, you can say particles or plasmas with different properties, different energies. and. Uh, some with certain energy, the heavier ones go there, the lighter ones go there. It's a kind of uh, gravitational magnetic positioning also. Yes, definitely. Maybe that's a way we can separate the CO2 GANs from the zinc oxide GANs. Yes, uh, Vlad Teodorescu, a Romanian scientist, has shown such an interesting things. Actually, he has more and there are more and more hypotheses uh, after more and more experiments. But my first idea was that when he added the uh, salty water to the salt water, he added more salt to it. Mm -hmm. So he used a, a higher con salt concentration of water to wash his gans. Then he immediately achieved the part going up and the part going down. Right. Furthermore, he had other experiments where he had an Erlenmeyer uh, balloon. Uh, you know those uh, conical. Uh, uh, Vessels, mm -hmm. and there he, he uh, assumed that that which goes on the top, uh, because of the uh, effect, uh, the mechanical effect of uh, this angle, the angle maybe yep. pushing yep. them also, compacting them, and makes them to stay there for yep. part of that. Yeah, definitely. Still, there are many like things that. to learn with uh, that. Yeah, there's certain. Uh, there's a different kind of flask, not the Erlenmeyer, but a similar one that um, has a certain s angle on the sides of the flask and is designed specifically to keep the uh, particles uh, down that way. So, yeah. can I, can I, may I ask a question? Certainly. Um, for both of you, because you're both very smart about this, and um, as Sandor just said, he added more salt to the solution in order to make it work. And I bought this stuff today at the pool store that actually is supposed to do that. And I'm just wondering how to work with it right now. Um, well, that's for pH. That's, that's different than uh, salt content. Well, the guy at the store said it for the pH. That's what I really want to keep adjusting mm -hmm. because instead of keep adding more salt, because one, one uh, puts salt in and one takes salt out. And well, he said that I can control the pH in the water by these two chemicals, and, and, the, and then I don't have to add salt. You know, like you, you said to me a long time ago, don't let that salt uh, uh, dissipate down too low. Or, so I'm just trying to find no, some. No, this different different issue altogether. The pH is okay. different than the salt content. You've got two different salts there, there, there that will change the pH, so you can, you can have the same amount of salts though in the water, and the pH could be radically different. You could have salt water with a pH of three and salt water with a pH of uh, eight or ten or something, uh, depending what's added to it. If you add acid to salt water, you still have the salts there, but it'll be a, a low pH. If you add uh, sodium hydroxide to your salt water, you'll have a high pH. So uh, these additives for pools or for others uh, usually have uh, such a salts or oxides uh, which are uh, dissolved, uh, they create different ions. 
under the ratio of the ions will give uh, what is the pH of the balance. So if, if you if you add uh, something like a magnesium carbonate, that's uh, pretty much alkaline. That's what those two chemicals that he gave me were. So with those two um, agents, I can keep my um, GANS production in a perfect pH balance. That's what I'm trying to achieve. But you're also That's introducing other materials into your uh, GANS production that shouldn't be in there. That's the whole thing about it. What are those two substances again? One of them was sodium um, sodium carbonate. It was one of them, right? Maybe it has a small brain. Sodium bisulfate. So you're you're introducing sulfur into the combination there. So more sodium and sulfur. And the other one was car sodium carbonate, right? Yeah, sodium carbonate. So then you've got a, you know, a carbonate that um, it might stay as sodium carbonate. Maybe it'll switch to uh, zinc carbonate or something with your zinc plate, for example. And all of a sudden you're creating a bunch of zinc. That's sodium will not uh, damage much because already you have sodium from the salt. Right. Yeah, and the car and, uh, carbonate. Sulfur is maybe not uh, the thing we, which we want in soil. Right. Some people want the so sulfur. That's somewhere. for making uh, pH minus. It means uh, to make the pH more acid. Right. You can make uh, the pH more acid uh, by adding the soda water. By adding more, just adding more salt will make it more acidy? No, soda uh, water. Soda water. Um, carbonic acid. Soda water. Soda carbonic water. acid. So if I, yeah. what if I just mix that uh, by uh, sodium bicarbonate? That will will make it more alkaline. If so it I will the pH only if, only if I need it. You right? can you can use uh, you can use baking soda. It's the same. It's actually that sodium carbonate. It's a baking soda. Well, that the only reason why I bought it was, but I just thought it was just a more pure substance, but. The, and, and the second reason why I only bought it was because I thought once I start um, taking uh, readings of the pH in my GANS uh, production, you know, is each metal going to fluctuate the, the, the metal or the uh, pH in the, um, the production of the uh, GANS? You know, like once I put cap, copper and zinc in into the salt, is that going to shoot the pH up to uh, nine five? And who cares about that? Well, I care about that because I want to use this in a personal <laughs> in a uh, um, in my oh, system. I but, understand. So, uh, are you taking uh, cucumbers? Cucumbers. Are you what? eating cucumbers sometimes? Do I eat cucumbers? Yes, yeah. I like cucumbers. Yes. They are alkaline. They are basically alkaline. And do you eat also tomatoes? Yes. Those are usually acid. Yes. So we eat all kinds of things. Yes. And as as uh, we have appetite for it, the body needs, and the body knows how to use them. Yeah, but I'm worried that my system doesn't know that. Well, wait a minute. Can I come in here a second? My understanding was that the, the fellows in the Philippines had discovered that by adding CO2 water uh, to your water, or otherwise using the ganses would balance the alkaline and the, uh, the, the acidity that the, the, the gans itself is balancing it. You don't need to balance it because you're already getting it balanced as soon as you make a CO2. Yeah. Uh, the, so why are you worrying about balancing the CO2 or your ganses that are already going to balance the water by adding artificial things? It's, let the GANS do its own thing. Well, I, I don't have any GANS to do anything with. Well, but you're making GANSes. You're, you're, you're talking about, you're, con you're setting up containers to, right. to make GANS and you're worried about the pH. But as soon as you make the GANS, the GANS is going to actually create the balance that it needs. It's going to balance itself. I thought that was the whole point of it, that you, you don't need to use those chemicals to balance the pH. You have the the Gantz water, the Gantz itself is doing that. So, so 
So so basically, we are, we are working with plasma fields, with plasma, and not with chemistry. It's a little, right. a little bit uh, more than chemistry. Right. In other words, you, the, the, the GANS is a better way to do what you're trying to do by itself. You don't need to well, do it. You're, 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 the thing is with the pH is that it'll be mostly dependent on your uh, distilled water that you use to wash the GANS with. The GANS itself won't have any particular pH to it unless it has a bunch of caustic left in it or or some other reason that it would be if you are you know used tap water and it was way off the scale or something. But yeah, People the, used to get uh, alkaline uh, GANS when uh, they forget uh, to wash their uh, copper plates, the right. nanocoated copper plates after processing them in, in caustic soda. Exactly. So, so if there are remaining, so that's a little quantity, it changes in huge values, uh, the, uh, the pH. Exactly. So you so have to wash, you... After you make uh, your nano coating, you have to wash your plates with yeah. distilled water. And so the same with the GANs, it should that, be uh, Nasty things, which is uh, the caustic soda. And the GANs right. should be washed multiple multiple times to dilute it and to to make, you know, not dilute the GANs, but to dilute the, the water and make it more and more distilled and pure that way. And then you should have more or less the pH of the distilled water, which could range. It could be, there's quite a range apparently in distilled water. So you might want to check your distilled water before you even use it. And at that point, you could alter the pH of the distilled water if you're really concerned. Maybe it was way off scale or something, um, and you wanted to, to to make sure it was more within, I don't know, the body blood pH or something like that, which is you know very exact, whatever it is, seven point three two or something crazy. Well, I didn't I didn't intend to use the chemicals for any particular purpose. But what I bought them for was in case if I needed to adjust anything at any particular part, I didn't think that they were, well, they can't be toxic because they are, we have everything we need here and that's part of it. And I didn't, I'm not going to sit there and be a chemist in it. I understand that part. But in the beginning, if I take readings and I think, like you said, if it's if I got a if I got a container that's sitting there at, at uh, eleven point seven, how do I get it down? Well, now I understand. Add a little more salt water to it, or add a little bit more um, to boost it. To well, the it only down. reason you'd have eleven point something is if you bunch you dumped a bunch of caustic into uh, you know say your caustic container might might have that high of a pH. And the only reason to bring it down would be, I don't know, you're doing some other experiment other than creating the nanomaterials. Because if you bring it down, then it's not going to create the same nano coating that it's uh, there to do. So um, let me spotlight that video there of the GANs. Um, yeah. Uh, and the other, the other thing is, if you're using, if you're using those, well, let me just finish while I got this thought here, oh, Shender. Well, while you're, if you're using those chemicals to alter your pH, what you're doing is you're adding the sodium to it, so you're actually changing your salt level radically, and you don't want to be doing that. Do you want to know what your salt level level is and keep it uh, constant? You know, five percent, ten percent, or whatever range. You don't want to be adding a bunch of sodium. Uh, that sodium carbonate and uh, the other sodium uh, sulfate will add more sodiums to it, make it more salty in effect. So you're okay. changing your salt concentration while you're trying to change the pH and so on. And okay. it could get to be too many variables to play around with there. But I think it's true we should be taking more pH tests and f trying to find out how pH affects our GANs and uh, the different changes there. It's one of the variables we aren't keeping a good enough eye on. What are you trying to show us there, Shandor? Uh, uh, yeah, that just I have to shake it again to happen again. Uh, I observe that uh, some uh, uh, GANs uh, uh, bits are going up, some are going down. Okay, yeah. Always they make some repositioning. You see, some are going yeah. up, 
And meanwhile, some are going down in the same time. Uh, you see on the right, it's going down. Yeah, quite, quite, quite quickly, too. Up. Yeah, almost on the same so plane. There is some motion, some life in between, and it's getting structured, reorganizing. And if you let it still for a longer time, you will find it, it will make some uh, uh, interesting... Uh, are any of the particles the staying at the top? Or are any of the particles mm -hmm. going to the top and staying there? Actually, I don't see anything staying. They go to the top and then they go to the bottom again. Right, so it's just a convection current or something perhaps that's yes. causing that. It's possible because now the sun uh, was... Uh, well, actually, probably what's I going on don't... is is you've got uh, convection currents because you didn't shake it up that much. You're going to have uh, the salt and the fresh, are, are, they're mixing with each other and they're carrying the particles as the salt goes uh, down and the fresh goes up and so on from the bottom to the top and top to the bottom. Yes, I, possible and also uh, the temperature is getting uh, to uh, right. even. This was cold and now the sun was shining uh, right over the bubbles. Yeah, yeah. These are still here, which I didn't shake. That's great, I like and that. If, if you don't uh, touch them for a long time, if they get uh, structured. Mm -hmm. so yeah. You see here like a scenery of the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's red, this one uh, is on, on the Mars. Mars. <laughs> it's getting structured. So there are many interesting things here. So they still one thing uh, in, uh, in the uh, CO2 kits, and uh, many I observed that uh, some bubbles are created and uh, they stick always to the walls, to the bottom and to the walls. And almost always the CO2 kit, not the copper oxide or CH3, correct? Mm, yes, it's the CO2 kit itself. Only the CO2 kit does that. So the question is, is it uh, uh, the uh, kit which is uh, uh, pulling the carbon in Hello? And what's going left, maybe, will be the hydrogen. And this is never on the plates, it's, it's on, on, on the walls, we can use in plates. Well, I guess what we would need to determine, is it hydrogen, or is it air, or is it oxygen? It's probably one of those three. Yeah, it's quite a technical challenge, how to get uh, well, uh, hydrogen. those tiny bubbles. Yeah. Hydrogen's easy in that if you can get the bubbles to the surface and have a flame there, they should pop. But sometimes oxygen can give a similar effect because it makes the flame uh, increase so much. If it's just air, then it won't have any effect on the flame. Anyway, it's an interesting thing. We do know that uh, salt or, or the, the CO2 kit will tend to pull pull air from, or pull CO2 from the air, the ambient atmosphere, into the solution. Uh, now you see, for the same size of plates, I obtained a different ratio of uh, the uh, gases. Same salinity, just different plates in different containers. Mm -hmm. Always uh, copper oxide is a smaller quantity, or it's more compact because it has a stronger gravity. And uh, after I harvested, I said, let's let try it once with electric current, for which I used a small battery. I don't know exactly how much it's a discharged uh, used battery from a, a laptop. It's a lithium ion uh, um, battery. Maybe it has three or four volts. So I put in series with that um, LED. You see light is on. And then, uh, after put it in, into a series with LED, with purpose to reduce the current to a few milliamps, maybe 10 milliamps or less. So then it goes to the copper plate, and then uh, to the nano-coated copper plate, and uh, the other end, the negative goes uh, to the uh, non-coated copper plate. So it's uh, not a fast process, it's not a, not an electrolysis or, or not a galvanoplasty or how to say, uh, but uh, it works. Uh, so now I have, uh, in, during the last night, uh, within uh, maybe eight hours, uh, a quantity which I had in one day earlier. But uh, to keep the quality, I mean, I'm keeping the, the current limited with an LED to milliamps. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is maybe helpful for uh, the copper gains. Or maybe if, if you are on industrial production of huge, you know, higher quantities, you can test instead of uh, that LED to, to, to play with other loads and uh, to increase or increase the voltage or something uh, to give a higher current just to find the balance when it still uh, brings up uh, this uh, uh, green stuff and not uh, making a reddish uh, thing. I was thinking we could use regular resistors. Um, I wonder if that uh, if there's a certain value resistor that would work proper. Yeah. And we could try different uh, resistors. Uh, we could try different batches with um, either, say, a, a few ohms resistance right down to the mega ohm uh, resistance range. Yes, yes. So, or uh, make a, a constant current generator from two transistors and a resistor. And see the difference, notice the difference of the color. So this is copper oxide, copper CuO2. This is a, a greenish. And this is more bluish. What's the difference? Here I added a little sugar. So uh, in the, in the uh, salt solution, I added a little sugar. And that uh, makes it uh, to have a different color, and probably this is uh, not uh, so much copper gas, copper oxide gas, but this is a CH4, it's a methane, methane gas. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. I plan on doing some experiments with maple sap as the, uh, instead of distilled water. And that will have natural sugars in it, as well as... Uh, few trace trace elements and so on it could be a good substance to use as a basic um, uh, substitute in the uh, in the um, GANS creation process so this uh, I'm trying to hold it still to show the color difference Oh, anyway. All right, thank you, Shandor. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. I just took my morning tea and now I have to make order in the lab, listening in the background and not much talking. I mute my microphone from now on. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much. We have to start wrapping things up here fairly soon, but um, I'm wondering if anyone else has something to offer here. See, Alex is here. How are you doing, Alex? Dropped all my gear. And, uh, okay, so anyone else have something to present or a uh, topic they'd like to bring up? Questions, etc.? Hi, Rick. This is Vivek here. Hi, Vivek. How are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. How are you? Good. Okay, uh, I don't know whether this was uh, brought up earlier on because I, I came in a little bit later, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Salama actually told me uh, by a text that uh, he took a container that he previously made CO2 GANs in. And in this time, what he did was he didn't put in any zinc or copper plates. He simply filled it up with salt water applied a three volt DC to it and it started producing GANs. But what were the electrodes he used? Just normal copper wires. Right, so it's copper and copper and uh, and salt water. And yep. what kind of GANs was produced? CO2 GANs. CO2 he used GANs. Uh, the, the, the container which he had previously made CO2 GANs in. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Armin showed earlier on, where the container was actually coated with that layer of uh, GANs, and uh, plenty of my own uh, IKEA boxes here are also coated in the same way. So 
uh, I believe Salama actually had that uh, such a container. All he did was uh, fill it up with salt water, apply three volts to it, DC, and it started producing CO2 GANs. What, what do we get when we have just a regular container and put uh, three volts into it of salt uh, water? I, I don't know. I haven't done that experiment. I guess. I'm just I guess wondering that, if that would does that produce process? does that produce something on its own? I'm wondering, is it the yeah. nano coated container that made the difference, or is it just the process of putting electricity into salt water produces a some kind of white substance? Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. Because um, if let's say he did not put in uh, the electricity and simply left the salt water to stand for a long time because the container already has the feel of CO2. And now we are introducing a medium in which more CO2 GANs can be created. Um, it, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here, maybe it'll take a much longer time, but over time, possibly CO2 GANs could have been produced there without the three volts. And maybe it was uh, the process was sped up by the three volts. Quite possibly. Eventually, uh, sorry. Uh, eventually, if you add the electricity, different voltages to salt water, eventually you separate the uh, the sodium from the chlorine. Uh, chlorine. It's already separated and you uh, dissolve it into water. You have salt water that, due to electrolysis, it may produce some uh, 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 sodium hydroxide, for instance or sodium perchlorate, hypochlorite, mm -hmm. which again gets in reaction with others, so it has different fields. And that could look like a white substance as well, like CO2 GANs probably. <clears throat> that has to react with the other components which are inside. Always consider the totality. What are all the conditions? What mm -hmm. else is that? So it's hard to guess. Yeah, we'd have to do some more controlled experiments with that and find out. That would be interesting. Perhaps. That yeah, I thought done. it was pretty interesting as well. So I thought I'd just throw it out there. And you see. know, if you add uh, the caustic soda to uh, sea salt uh, water or to sea water, already you get a precipitate. Mm -hmm. And there you have so many other things, not just sodium chloride. It depends on the quality of the soil, the purity, what other elements are in. It's a, quite a complex thing, like, like life itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you see, the present science doesn't explain many things. It just observes the effects and they do such a strange things like uh, this Hadron Collider. They want to find out the secrets of the creation by pressing together everything with a huge force. It's like if you would like to study how a chicken works, uh, to just compress it and then to look at the leftovers and to guess uh, why the chicken make eggs. Yeah, right. <clears throat> well, we have to be more open, open-eyed and open-minded a bit. Yeah, if you need chicken, whoever does that with the chicken. And, and now we know about plasma. And we know about fields. One thing I'm really interested in is uh, how the innovation team in the Philippines is coming along with uh, running a car on pure plasma alone and without any fuel. Well, that would certainly be the ultimate and uh, that would be a fun one to play with actually. I'd like to get into that more. Yeah, I mean, even in, uh, in, in, in our local context in Singapore, the uh, private car hire thing is uh, really coming on song right now, where more people are using their own private cars for things like Uber and Grab. So, you know, if, if one could help them as well as the taxi drivers to uh, alleviate uh, a large cost involved, which is fuel, you know that would be that would be very very helpful. That would help them to uh, put more food on the table and you know better quality of life back home. 
But what about all the poor people in the tar sands that you're going to put out of business and lose their jobs trying to get oil out of the earth? They're already out of business, Rick. They just been, got burned out. They've been burned out. We've yeah. been burned out yeah. literally from that, yes. those jobs anyway. They are a burnout and they're not... They call them high quality jobs only because they're high paying jobs, not because they're necessarily, uh, you know, the best job that you want to be doing in your life for a benefit to others and the planet. Yeah, I mean, we have enough uh, VLCCs and ULCCs worth of um, crude oil floating around on the high seas right now to satisfy the demand of plastics for for, for decades and centuries to come. So, you know, there's no need for us to drill for more oil. And, you know, recycling is another way of doing it. And as per what, you know, we are learning in plasma science, uh, we create the appropriate fields and we get the material that we want. So mining, mining is a thing of the past, going by yep. that way. That's right. It'll be looked at as a primitive non-cost-effective means of uh, getting energy very shortly, I believe. Not to mention dangerous. Especially if you're in a burning city. <laughs> boy, oh boy, it's amazing that they're still having trouble with fires in that area of Fort McMurray and the uh, apartment building just went up there the other day again. Um, it's amazing when there's you know, you're talking about 80,000 people to 100,000 people that have been displaced. And uh, uh, only about a half of them are, are even considering moving back at this point. So it's, it's, it's made an amazing difference to that area and uh, will, will be so for many, many years. They have to adapt and change into different ways of doing things that are more uh, self-sustaining basically they're going to be forced into it in Fort McMurray <clears throat> so it's interesting how um, this whole saga of fuels and maybe it'll actually come to a close due to the effects of fire which is strange because uh, the main reason I got involved with the Keshe Foundation, or one of the main reasons, is hearing Mr. Keshe say in the early video, um, uh, the very first video, uh, was it called Keshe One uh, um, Matter and something, it's got to do with the book one. Anyway, he says that it's time for mankind to stop the burning. And I thought that was very profound and, uh, and you know, he could explain how and why we can do that. And um, here it is now, we've got this city in northern Alberta and Canada that is, has been, or is now, virtually destroyed due to burning. <laughs> and it is enough to affect the... Uh, the production of the oil production in Canada was uh, down to half of its regular production due to this fire and so on. And it's made uh, uh, repercussions through the whole... They're having trouble with some of, the, uh, some of the gas stations keeping fuel in the stations now because of all this. Uh, <clears throat> there's also an unplanned shutdown to one of the refineries at the same time. It's caused a shortage of gas at the same time as all this burning is going on so it's strange how things come around and um, definitely we can see the phasing out of the fossil fuel thing within definitely a few years as the electric vehicles come on strong um, in their popularity and the new ones are getting cheaper and cheaper in price and uh, They've got uh, the savings in fuel alone. It could be in the hundreds of dollars a month for a lot of people. It's, there's so many win-win uh, situations, uh, the way things are going, that the fossil fuels will be phased out within uh, five years, no doubt about it. 
and we'll all have self-driving electric cars by then. So <clears throat> that's just the way it's going and uh, looking forward to that day in a way. <clears throat> Other than I like driving, so I'm not sure about getting into a car that has no steering wheel and no brake pedal. Yeah, I'm not giving up driving anytime soon. I love it too much. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing about it. Um, if we're going to go into space, are we going to love that as much? Are we going to want to come back to good old planet Earth so we can buzz around in our cars and smack into each other and race and do stuff like that? <laughs> that's kind of the big question. Um, if it's not fun to travel in space, are we going to want to do it? Uh, in other words, if you just go into a, a sort of semi-comatose state, maybe suspended animation or something, and uh, away you go for 10 or 20 years in that suspended animation state without actually experiencing any of the trip, are we going to enjoy that? Or Now it seems like the trip is... is um, the experience of the trip itself is more, almost more important than the getting to the other end. And it is more important in many cases if you're just out for a, a joy ride or a trip in the country or something. You're not so interested in your destination. You're interested in having an enjoyable experience along the way. So is it going to be that way? Can we make that experience enjoyable in space so that we want to continue doing it? Or are we want to are we want to are we wanting to get back to good old planet Earth as soon as possible? And all the kids are whining, when are we going to get there? <laughs> when are we going to be home? And you know, how long is it going to be? Only four more years. Just hang on. You know, or <laughs> only four more millennia. Just take care and just keep. Uh, keep waiting um, so I, I guess these are questions that will come up as we start to get closer to that place of actually uh, being true voyagers in space which we are now already uh, but I mean more in vehicles that can handle that sort of situation other than our own vehicles of our soul vehicle or spirit vehicle which is uh, profoundly um, 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 suited up for that adventure it's a, that's what it does best is be a voyager it's our physicality that has trouble out in space I think the rest of it's fine All right, we'll need to wrap things up here, I think, unless someone has something, some blockbuster they want to drop out here at the end, which often happens. All the good stuff people say to the end. What about you, Libby? You got any good things you want to show? I'd have to unmute your microphone. I don't want, don't want to embarrass you if you're not ready there. Anyway, okay, let's uh, wrap things up for now, I think, and we've covered a few things here. It's been fun. Thanks, everybody, for participating and, uh, and uh, showing your stuff. And, uh, yeah, that'll be it for Wednesday, June 8th now. It was Tuesday, June 7th, 2016. Keshe Plasma Reactor Group. And... Thanks once again for everybody for attending. We'll end the live stream now and